Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to today's reddit quickie video taken from the HFY subreddit called Good Neighbors written by LG Father Anthracite the link to the original will be down below and as always I hope that you enjoy Gelenor was a prison world. It was generally habitable, but fairly barren. There was large bodies of water and a decent microbiome. Life was hard, but with sufficient labor, sustainable. There was no easily retrievable ore deposits. Inmates were brought in under heavy guards. Ships were stationed around the planet to prevent rescue missions. Once the transport showed up, the inmates were dropped onto the planet in a pod, similar to one of those used by the dropship troops. Instead of weapons and gear, what they got was a store of farm tools, rations and seeds. A small inflatable hand dome was included, and a loadout was adjusted to the needs of each species, but was generally the same. Some included breeding pairs of small prey animals. Some included extra thermal insulation. Pods were dropped in a wide pattern to prevent too much buildup of populations. Most were near the shorelines to provide easy access to water. Some the dry dusty plains where it was suited the inmates needs. Aside from the orbital blockades, there were no guards. A trip to the surface was one way. Aside from prey animals, there were no breeding pairs. Sexes or similar species went to different planets. Inmates would often spend the rest of their lives on the prison worlds. Only the most heinous criminals would be dropped onto them. So funds for whom there was no possibility of recovery or reform. Not just murderers, but killers. Crimes of passion were one thing, but inmates of Kelenor were more savages who were not only tortured, but dismembered and or cannibalized multiple victims. John Gorin was dropped onto Kelenor for his crimes that he had committed against the crew of pirates. It didn't matter to the Galactic Quorum that those pirates had destroyed his ship, killed his wife and children, and left him barely alive, floating in a life pod. To get scooped up by a passing cargo ship that heard the distress speaking of the pod. What mattered to them was that he had hunted them down and where the bait ship waited for them to board. After they boarded, he methodically hunted them down and killed them one at a time, using a variety of slow and painful methods. John didn't care. With the family gone, there was nothing left to care about. The pod landed and John popped the hatch, and he looked at his surroundings. Off in the distance was a large lake. The ground was covered in a low scrubby plants. John started to unpack the pod, and he had three months' supply of freeze-dried food, a small ham dome, a toolkit, some seeds and fertilizer, and a couple bags of bird feed, and a couple of chickens and a rooster in cages sounded by the cargo. He spent the first day on the planet carrying everything towards the lake. He set up a few hundred feet from the shore and, using his toolkit, dismantled the pod and took the drop seat, harnesses, and hatch and a few other odds and ends. The second day, he used the shovel to clear a patch of ground and he used the seeds and fertilizer to start a garden. He used some panels to drop the pod's interior and make a small hatch for the chickens, and he bedded it with the scrub plants that he cleared from the garden. He made a small enclosure to corral the birds from the cages and some webbing from the pond. On the third day, he carried water from the lake and checked for eggs, but found none. He made sure to feed the birds and then ate half a ration. Things followed this pattern for weeks. In his spare time, he continued to dismantle the drop pod. He had started to gather eggs regularly and would candle them with a small flashlight. One or two looked like they might have a viable embryo. So, he left them in the nests and he began to dig deep holes, keeping it covered with the pod panel. He weeded out the garden and was starting to see plants pushing up. One day he saw a creature approaching. It resembled a giant ant. As it got closer, he moved the various tools and supplies around his encampment. When it was within a few hundred yards, John went out to meet it. He carried out a small translator from his toolkit. Can I help you? John called out. The translator, sensing another unit nearby, transmitted his words. My name is Bob. I come to welcome you to Kelenor. I seek no conflict. The creature was naked and rising its limbs to show it carried no weapons. Well, thanks for stopping by, Bob. My name is John. But I am not really in the mood for socializing. 
I understand. I will approach no closer. Allow me to impart a few details before I leave. Sure, go ahead. I live a few days north of here. I am a Zixchi. I just wanted to let you know that a trade caravan comes through every few months and that I welcome opportunities to communicate with others. If ever you feel like company, please feel free to stop by my home. I'll remember that. By the way, before you go, do you need water? No, thank you for offering, but I have sufficient internal stores for my return. Safe journey. Oh, Bob, one last thing. What were you put here for? I killed everyone from a crew of pirates who killed my family. An understandable question. I am a war criminal. I slaughtered whole troops of surrendered enemies, soldiers. Good day, John. John continued to tend his garden and his chickens. He ate half rations and slowly he was dropping weight. He was eating a few eggs a day though and the weight loss had tapered down some. He finished a large hole in the ground and started to gather stones. Carefully he lined the hole with stones, being sure to cover the floor and all the walls. It took many days to find and haul all the stones to his new home. He placed the pot panel over the top and so that it formed a roof. There was a small channel on the side to allow access and a smaller plate acted as his door. Here, in the rudimentary root cellar, he stored his eggs, unopened rations, spare seeds and tools. It also held several jugs of water from the lake that he had boiled, one part at a time on the tiny cooking stove from the toolkit. It ran on a nuclear batteries, so it would last a lifetime. John knew that it wasn't really nuclear, but it wasn't something he understood. He moved his half dome over to the pod plate to keep the sun off of it, and disguised it from his new visitors. He was grateful for the survival training that was mandatory for all human ship captains on long-term crews. Because of that, he knew to boil the water and how to make a rudimentary root cellar, and to not clean the eggs of his chickens so that they would last longer. He also knew about the basic farming and crop rotations. He diligently watered the ponds every two days, weeded constantly and was sure to keep his eggshells and ration scraps for composting. He had dug several more pits smaller in scale. One he set in a latrine, the other nearer the farm was the compost heap, and he turned it over every week. Time went on. The plants bloomed, the flowers fell off, the fruits and vegetables swell. John harvested. He stored the hardier root vegetables in the cellar ate the less hardy ones, and saved the seeds to replant. Six months of solitude saw him growing a second round of vegetables. He had been dropped near the equator, and so got a little in the way of seasonal temperature variation. Every day was long hours of labor, maintaining his home and garden, prepping water, gathering raw materials like rocks, and he began to build a stone cover over his inflated habdone. The heavy polymer skin and support coils were the mold, and rocks held in place with mud were the walls. After two years of constant work and struggle, John felt at home here. His house was a stone and mud-covered hab dome with a now-stocked root cellar. His chickens had multiplied from two to twenty, allowing for many eggs and occasional meat. He had enough food and water and a relatively safe place to live. The only thing he lacked was companionship. One day he packed a small pouch made of woven fiber from some of the native scrub plants and a couple dozen hard-boiled eggs, some veggies and a jug of boiled water, and started north. A day and a half later he saw on the horizon a hab camp and he walked towards it. He made no attempt to move quietly, and in fact got louder the closer he came. He purposely crushed shrub bushing underfoot, causing loud cracking noises. He saw the hulking figure of the Zichki. We waved at John, who continued to approach our beard more quietly. As he came to the alien's homestead proper, he called out in greeting, Hello, Bob! Mind if I come in? Please enter and be seated. Welcome to my home! Came the response, translated through the same device as always. John sat on a rock near and looked at the main sitting area around the dome. Several large rocks were moved together in a stand with a stove similar to his own. Bob was stirring a pot of something. It smelled good to John. How have you been? asked Bob, finishing his dish and turning off the burner. He lifted the pot and brought it over and set it between the two of them. Are you hungry? I think we should be able to eat similar things. It held out a small utensil for John. 
John took the utensil, but before eating, he reached into his bag and pulled out a handful of eggs and a small couple bell peppers. I know it isn't much, but I brought these that you could try. He held out his hand and placed the food on the hands of his host. The white and brown ones are called eggs, and they are ready to eat. I already cooked them. The green ones are called bell peppers, and they can be eaten raw or cooked. If you like them, you can add them to your garden. There are seeds inside. Don't eat the seeds, they're kind of gross. A lovely gift, John, thank you, Bob replied. He pointed into the pot and then reached out with his own utensil and started to eat. They sat in silence for a while, eating the stew. After a while, Bob began to talk. He spoke about his life before, and how he had once had a hive mate, an offspring, and then the war broke out. And that ended. After his family was gone, he joined the war. He talked about finding those responsible for making them pay. He talked of the pain in his heart. Still, after all these years, his loneliness was crushing and he'd hoped that John would come. He had been overjoyed at his close neighbor and understood the caution. It made him hope that when John was polite, if nervous, when they first spoke. It was a relief when John asked if he needed supplies for the return trip. A true civilized being not the traders who were gruff and only spoke of business. After a while, Bob became silent and John spoke of his family and how much he loved and missed them all. He talked of the hunt that he had gone on, no, that it meant that he would end up here, and not caring. He talked about how he would even live on a harsher world if it meant that they could come back. He spoke of long nights alone waiting for sleep that never came, and how Bob had been courteous and civil and non-threatening. How glad he was when the hard work was done to have someone who would talk to him. They both sat in silence for a long time, no longer remembering the right ways to have a conversation. Finally, John said, So, what's in the stew? It's delicious. Our long and rambling conversation started after that. It went deep into the night. After that, Bob and John would visit each other every month or so, and they would cook their best dishes for each other, and spend the whole night talking about anything. The growing cycles, results, the weather, the trade caravan products. John was able to sell pepper seeds at a high value and got some good equipment. Bob brought John a gift on one of his crop seeds as well. John gave Bob a couple chicks and showed him how to care for them, and over the years, they formed a tight bomb. Zitchki were longer-lived species than humans, and life was difficult on Kelenor. One day, Bob came to visit his old friend. The chicks that he'd been given years ago had flourished, and he had come to give John an update on them. He found his friend still, and silent on the ground near his hab. He was cold and stiff, unresponsive. Bob knew that death had come for his friend, and he let out a keening wail. He took his friend out to the plain and buried him, as he knew there was the custom. Over the next few months, he packed out what supplies and equipment he could carry. Chickens, vegetables, tools. One day on his last trip, he found a small book with a handwritten pages. He saw that it was written in a galactic common script, a language used by soldiers and merchants, people who traveled all over and dealt with many species. John's diary consisted of many entries, but the one that brought the Zetchki the most mirth and joy was the one after John had first returned to his camp after visiting Bob the first time. Bob seems cool. He has been through a lot of things similar to my situation. I brought him some peppers and some eggs. I hope he likes them. He seems like a nice person, and I hope to get him know him better. We both spilled our guts when we first got together, probably because it's been so long since we've had anyone to talk to. I look forward to our next visit. I think I'm going to have to teach him how to cook, though. The stew he fed me was like eating wet vegetable sand. Well, it's not like there's anything better to do on this rock, and it was edible, at least. I slept well for the first time in my home. It was a comfort to know that I am not alone. I hope that we can continue. To be good neighbors. And that, my friends, is the end of this Reddit quickie. I hope that you enjoyed. If you'd like to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, listed in the description down below. The easiest and best way would be to share this video and my channel as much as possible. I'll see you all in the next video, and I hope that you have a good one until then. Cheers.